Notre Dame is a place of icons. Architectural, religious, cinematic, and of course, on the football field itself. But how did a small private Catholic school in Indiana embed itself into popular culture? By hustling its way to the top. Gridiron Traditions is built by the Home Depot. Non-fans might see Notre Dame football as elitist, too special to be in a conference, all the home games and 99% of the road games on national TV, a large and spread out fan base clinging to bygone success. But I promise the come up is worth considering in all this. Notre Dame was an upstart at one point, and when it was an upstart, it did a lot of myth building, playing anyone that they could, anywhere they could, and then making as many possible stories to tell the press as possible. Win one for the Gipper probably didn't happen, okay? Newt Rockney one time actually lied to his team and said his kid was dying, and the kid ran up to the whole team at the train station after the game perfectly healthy and happy. He would do anything to motivate his team and anything to promote Notre Dame, and I think that's carried forward. Building a brand with all the subtlety of a crypto bro is one takeaway there, but balancing that with the willingness to take the long train rides to play anybody expanded the brand's reach from shore to shore. In 1913, the Gold and Blue scheduled powers Army, Penn State, and Texas. They first blew the cadets away with the then innovative approach of having your quarterback hit his receivers in stride rather than flat-footed and finished that season unbeaten. They had arrived but didn't change their scheduling approach, which is why they count schools as varied as Navy, Pitt, and Southern Cal among their longtime rivals. Sort of like the Dallas Cowboys, they're America's team in a lot of ways. Notre Dame's always been famous for its Subway alumni. Well, what does that mean? That's people who actually didn't attend Notre Dame, but they're diehard Notre Dame fans. I played for Notre Dame, I threw a pass. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons for that is it's a Catholic institution. There are obviously a lot of Catholics in the United States, but also a lot of Catholics who attended Catholic schools that don't have football teams. So they kind of adopted Notre Dame. The old kind of quip is Notre Dame loves two things, being Catholic, second is independence. And sometimes those things get in reverse order. Sometimes they like independence even being more than Catholic. That's supposed to be a joke, but it didn't go over very well. This approach wasn't entirely by design. Notre Dame was rejected for admission into the Western Conference, which later became the Big Ten, on more than one occasion. Those decisions weren't all about football. Anti-Catholic and anti-immigrant sentiments were prevalent at the time. The term fighting Irish was used to mock the students of the school. In 1927, university president Reverend Matthew Walsh officially adopted the nickname in part to reclaim the insult. Their leprechaun, which replaced live Irish terriers as mascot in 1965, strikes a similar tone. The school's position is that it's intentionally a caricature. Those explanations don't eliminate any offense caused, but they help explain why the choices persist. Plenty of teams have worn special green jerseys around St. Patrick's Day, but Notre Dame's history with the hues started with utility, not holiday celebration. Blue, representing truth, and yellow, representing light, were the university's colors at its founding. We'll get to the gold shortly. But wearing a dark blue jersey, like many of their opponents in the 1920s, made it hard to tell who your teammates were at a distance. Enter the Irish wearing green every once in a while. Coach Newt Rockney's solution to make his pass catchers easier to spot downfield for the quarterback. There's a little bit of a question as to when they actually debuted. Some say 1921, that was a loss to Iowa. Some say 1926, which was a win over Penn State. I think everybody can agree that the green jerseys were definitely worn in that game. In the 1940s, they started wearing green full time and rode that look to four national titles in the decade. The green cycled from primary to alternate uniform status in the late 50s and early 60s before emerging from a period of dormancy on October 22, 1977. With Joe Montana under center, the number 11 Irish crushed number 5 USC 49 to 19 and route to another national championship. They did go green full time for a few years following, but taking home the jeweled shillelagh, one of the most storied rivalry trophies in the game, in 1977 was foundational. Still known as the green jersey game, it serves as inspiration for all subsequent appearances of big game green. Although enough of those sequels have resulted in heartbreaking losses, 
that a not insignificant contingent of Notre Dame fans would rather not see the color they regard as cursed. Touchdown, SC! Gold is the opposite of a cursed color in South Bend. They were so into the Gilded Dome and Mary statue atop their main building, circa 1882, that gold replaced yellow as an official school color. One Golden Dome, of course, inspired another, as the 1950s brought us the launch of those supremely shiny helmets. Up until the 2010s, they were hand-painted by student managers each week. But even with a more advanced application process today, the formula still contains actual flakes of 24 karat gold left over from regilding the main building's toppers. I have not and have never been susceptible to the mystique of Notre Dame in any way. However, I appreciate a nice bass boat finish. And that looks like the sparkly paint that you see on the side of bass boats and sport boats. As a Southerner, I've got to appreciate that. The dome isn't the only campus monument intertwined with the football team. There's also the Word of Life mural. That name's not ringing a bell. That's because you know it as Touchdown Jesus, which students dubbed it almost instantly from its 1964 unveiling due to that hands to the sky pose. Seeing it on TV won't help you register its sheer size of 134 feet tall or its orientation peeking over the north end zone of Notre Dame Stadium. Built with the input of Rockney and opening in 1930, the stadium retains a ton of charm with its slashed end zones, modestly sized video board, ban on advertising, and delicious hot chocolate. Swaths of the stadium had wooden benches until 2017. If you want the kind of retro theme park experience of college football, then Notre Dame is intentionally so. You'll walk in and go, this is exactly what I thought it would be. And no more, it is exactly as told. Maybe the most honest experience when it comes to the fan in college football. Tells no lies. The game presentation still offers plenty of fan engagement though, with the oldest continuously operating college band in the US playing, if not the best fight song in the sport, at least the most famous. The kilted Irish Guards post-game victory clog is pretty great too. But the most interesting communal act for our purposes is Irish fans wearing the shirt, capital T and capital S. It's a deceptively simple name for such an innovation. Predating Penn State's whiteouts and Texas A&M's maroon outs, both of which we've covered in this series, Notre Dame fans have purchased a new design of a matching shirt every season since 1990. What started as senior Brennan Harvath's idea to foster unity and raise funds for student activities is still doing just that, with a portion of the profits also helping students who face extraordinary medical expenses. These t-shirts for a cause have featured some incredible artwork over the years, but no piece of Notre Dame art gets the players going like the vaunted play like a champion today sign. With blue hand lettering on a three by four piece of wood, it looks like it's been there for all of the Irish's record tying seven Heisman winners to slap on their way to the field. In reality, when Tim Brown won the trophy in 1987, the sign had only been up for a year. When Lou Holtz was hired as head coach in 1986, he dove into researching the school's traditions. After spotting the sign in an old photo, he asked what became of it. Nobody knew. So Holtz commissioned Lori Wenger, who worked as a graphic designer and sign painter in the school's maintenance shop, to make him a new one. In 1988, the undefeated Irish won it all, bringing in their latest era of dominance and TV exposure, meaning a bunch of people and places wanted their own version of the sign to display. The real life Rudy Rudiger was an early customer. Most of us, myself included, have a play like a champion today sign somewhere in their house. So mine is leading down from the top floor of our house, the stairs that go into the kitchen, and it's right there. So <laughs> when I wake up in the morning, I go down for my coffee, I'm like, boom. It just puts that good thought in your mind. Play like a champion today. You might not win, but play like a champion. I will also say it's in a lot of like bad sports bars. That's an indication that you might be in a bad sports bar if you see that sign up. Good stadium, good team, bad sports bar. That's what that sign tells you. All that merch from replica signs to mugs to keychains generated decent revenue for the trademark owners. Not Notre Dame, but the artist and her husband, Lori and Ron Wenger. Eventually, the side struck a licensing agreement, but who Notre Dame pays for that deal changed in 2021, with a group of investors headlined by Lou Holtz himself having purchased the trademark to the slogan from the Wangers. Where this gets even more complicated is no one has ever turned up the source image Holtz claims to have seen. 
Annoyed by all of this is the University of Oklahoma, where Coach Bud Wilkinson hung a Play Like a Champion Today sign as early as the 1940s. We know definitively it was there by the 50s through photos and newspaper accounts. But the phrase didn't originate at Oklahoma, nor does the school claim it did. Wilkinson probably brought it with him from Minnesota, but that's as much as we know about the origins of Play Like a Champion Today. What isn't in question is the school we associate with it now. Such is the power of the Notre Dame brand. This is a school that started playing football in 1887, didn't have a head coach until 1894, and stacked wins on its way to prominence over the next 30 years. The players at the end of the game, win or lose, go to the student section and the alma mater plays. And the players sing it, their arms draped around each other, swaying. And as a student, you're there in the stands with your arms draped around your friends and you're swaying and you're trying to remember the words and you're singing it. And it's just this beautiful homage from the players to the students as if we are one. You know, at Notre Dame, they don't really have like athlete dorms, they don't have special classes for athletes and things like that. We're all in school together. It can almost bring tears to your eyes. None of these stories are likely to convince any of the haters to soften their stances, but there's something to be said for inventing your legends out of whole cloth and playing so well, you make them stick. This episode of Gridiron Traditions is built by The Home Depot, how doers get more done.